hot biscuits. The Jewels of the Trade podcast. Encouraging professionals with industry inspiration, gemology, and more. So we're talking to you all about garnet today, specifically one of the lesser known garnets, Demantoid, which in my opinion is particularly fascinating as the current impact of Demantoid mining is definitely worth learning more about and you'll understand why in this episode. I will say I've gone down the rabbit hole on researching Madagascar Demantoid, which we'll be discussing today with John Ferry of Prosperity Earth. So Madagascar is an incredibly fascinating country. It has a beautiful geology. It's actually known as the Red Island. It has lemurs, which are incredible. Did you know they're the only primate we know of that uses echolocation to source food? And gemstones. And there's gemstones. Like, I'm just obsessed. So demantoid is green androdite garnet, which is different from savorite. Savorite, if you remember, is green grossular garnet. Garnet being a group of minerals, including almondine, spessartine, pyrope, Savorite, of course, which we talked about on another podcast, so check that out and more. Some garnets are used for jewelry. Some are used for countertops. The name garnet probably comes from the word pomegranate, which makes sense because it is and has long been known as a red gemstone, but can actually come in a range of colors from orange to pink, red to purple, browns, greens, and just about everything in between. It can rarely, rarely be blue. It's certainly underrated for its spectrum of color. It's underrated for its durability as well, in my opinion. Garnet is usually natural, untreated. Uh, Some garnets can shift in color as a gem group. It really has a lot going for it. Unique to demantoid garnet, though, is its fire. Demantoid actually means diamond-like because it certainly has a diamond-like presence, unlike other garnets and certainly unlike most other gemstones. Really sounds like we're hyping demantoid, but that's because you're actually shopping for a demantoid yourself. You've been talking about that for a couple of years now. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, So for those of you listening, (laughs) if you don't follow me on Instagram, stop what you're doing right now. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on Pinterest. It's at Jules of the Trade. So it's Jules underscore of the underscore the underscore trade. You'll inevitably see my 10 carat Rodolite garnet that I wear like all the time. I love it, but it needs a friend. So ever since I met Irina, John's wife from Prosperity Earth, Back in 2020, I have had my heart set on a demantoid garnet ring to wear next to my Rodolite. So when I'm ready to buy, I'll definitely be shopping with Prosperity Earth, who is who we're talking to today. Demantoid garnet has a hardness of 6.5 to 7, which John talks more about in part two of our podcast. It is a calcium iron silicate and is part of the cubic crystal system. So that's the groundwork for Demantoid Garnet. Next, we're going to hear from John Ferry of Prosperity Earth, a Madagascar miner of Demantoid Garnet. This is part one. In part two, which will be a separate podcast episode, John will dive into the gemological details of Demantoid and explain why it's such a great gemstone to wear and take pride in. In this episode, part one... John is going to give us insight into the mining of Madagascar demantoid, the challenges that come with that, and how it has positively affected the Malagasy mining community where they operate. John, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jordan. It's great to be here and really excited to be on your podcast. John Ferry is the owner of Prosperity Earth, a vertically integrated demantoid garnet mining operation out of Madagascar. If you work in a jewelry store, you've probably heard of Russian or Namibian demantoid garnet, but I personally believe the Madagascar material deserves as much recognition or maybe even more. In part one of the podcast interview with John, we'll be discussing the mining and cutting of demantoid garnet in Madagascar, and in part two, we'll be talking more about the exceptionalism of the stone and all of the juicy details you need to know about it. John, you have a fascinating background. How did you get into gemstone mining? Great question, Jordan. Sometimes I ask that myself because it's been quite a circuitous journey. I um, have a degree in history from Harvard, went down to work on Wall Street following graduation. I was a financial aid student, so the idea of paying off student loans in the quickest possible time was very appealing to me. Um, Spent 10 years working on Wall Street, but was looking for something a little bit more entrepreneurial and international related. So through 
a little bit of serendipitous luck, was able to make a great connection to Madagascar and took some of the money that I'd made on on Wall Street in a you know ten year career and parlayed that into making investments in the beautiful island of Madagascar. It sounds like you weren't looking for a gemstone career. It sounds like you you were kind of headed in a different direction and this sort of happened to you. That's a great way of, of putting it. I absolutely wasn't looking for a gemstone career. And in fact, uh, my wife, who's been in the retail jewelry business for uh, close to 25 years now, always made the joke that if I come work with her, that's going to be the end of the marriage. <laughs> so <laughs> there was always a kind of implicit separation of, of church and state, which I think it, for any family owned businesses out there, they'll get the inside joke that having some boundaries is always a good thing. But no, to your point, I wasn't necessarily looking for a career in gemstones as I was for something that called me and that I was passionate about and that I believed in. And at the end of the day, where we first started out more in agribusiness and then have more recently migrated to color gems, this is something that, you know, is absolutely a passion of mine and touches on so many of the things that I believe in. So call it dumb luck or call it just kind of following and being in tune with what motivates you and and what excites you, it kind of all came together and happened. Well, for those listening, we're going to get into more details later on in the podcast, but this venture with Demantoid Garnet for John has been not just beneficial to John and his family, but really the, the people involved with the mining operation in Madagascar. But before we get into that, John, I have to ask you, why Demantoid? Uh, I mean, this is a gemstone that many, many people haven't even heard of. How did this gemstone make its way into your life? Yeah. So Demantoid for um, people that know about it, or for those of you that have heard of it, but don't know that much about it is a incredibly exciting and beautiful and rare gemstone. And I would go so far as to say that it's the most undervalued of all color gemstones out there undervalued based on the fact that in jewelry and colored gems, the driver of value tends to be, you know, beauty and rarity. And obviously you need items that are durable as well. <laughs> There's a lot of beautiful and rare things out there, but they're not built to last. Demantoid hits on all three of those points. And whether you know what Demantoid is or not, the first time you see it, it's incredibly eye-catching it's, it's beautiful. It's exciting because of the fire and brilliance that it kicks off. So it's um, one of those things where I saw an opportunity in Madagascar along with my business partner, and we'll talk more about him in a, in a moment, but we saw an opportunity together to really mine, add value to this exceptionally beautiful and rare gemstone and bring it to market in a way that has never been done before. I hope that's exciting to a lot of your listeners, be they retailers or designers and ultimately the end customer, because that's that's what we're trying to reach. Well, and Demantoid Garnet, for as long as I've known about it, has been more promoted in regards to Russian material. Like a lot of people pushed the horsetail inclusions in the Russian material, but the Namibian is is a little less talked about in the Madagascar, even less so. And my guess is that the Madagascar hasn't received as much attention because it's kind of the newcomer to the Demantoid market. Is that correct? It is. And that's correct. Let me just get something right off the table. We have Russia and Demantoid beat by a long stretch. <laughs> Let me um, be a little bit more modest, Jordan. You're absolutely right that where Madagascar materials, the new kid on the block, being a relatively new discovery, the deposits only a little over a decade old, and that compares to the Russian material, which is is found in the Ural Mountains, that's been around for 150 plus years. It's demantoid at the end of the day, but there's a lot of when you peel back the layers, there's a lot of unique features that Madagascar and demantoid has, and um, not least of which is the uh, size of the crystals, which tend to be bigger than both. Russian and Namibian material. And they're generally uh, free of inclusions, which is a good thing because the signature property of Demantoid is the, is the fire and brilliance. And whereas for collectors, horsetail inclusions are interesting, we also have inclusions, you know, rare earth elements, velastonite, which are needle-like inclusions, you know, bismuth 
a rare earth element that was, you know, recently defined as a signature property of Madagascar. At the end of the day, what I tell, you know, a lot of our clients is buy, of course, the gem that speaks to you and that you fall in love with, but you never go wrong buying gems that are that are more free of inclusions and really have that fire and brilliance. Absolutely. I agree. And John, I recently read the article that you recommended to me from Gemme discussing inclusions in the Russian versus Namibian versus Madagascar demantoid garnet material. And it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that the geology where the Madagascar demantoid is found is more similar to the Namibian and that they're both quite different from the Russian. And so when examining the internal characteristics, the Madagascar and the Namibian might look a little bit more alike under magnification than they would to Russian. That's exactly right. And before we get into some of the the science behind it, which is quite interesting, even if you're not a mineralogist or geologist, I want to give a quick shout out to the author of said article, Han Kozwan, who's a research scientist at the Naturalist Museum in Amsterdam. That's at Darwin's museum, by the way. For those of you who are not familiar with it, extremely prestigious in, in Europe. And Hanko did unbelievable research, uh, groundbreaking research on inclusions. And as you mentioned, you know, the signature properties of what makes Madagascan demantoid different than Namibian, different than Russian. And also for the Journal of Gemology, which is Gemme's uh, publication, the editor of that journal is Brendan Lars, who's a, a fantastic editor and well known in the in the circle. So if you get a chance to read that article or simply page through some of the pictures, the photo micrography is, is fantastic. And we're going to link to that article in the podcast. So for those of you listening, the link is here and ready to be clicked. <laughs> fantastic. Wonderful. It's a whole nother world looking at any type of colored gemstone at 50 times, 100 times magnification. It almost looks otherworldly of sorts. But back to your point, Jordan, Madagascan and Namibian demantoid deposits are very different geologically speaking than the Ural Mountains in, in Russia. And one of the other big deposits, um, and, and there's very few, that's kind of it around the world, which are the Persian deposits. Madagascan is a scarn deposit, and it's actually quite unique for Madagascar because it's the first representation of contact metamorphism. So it's a really kind of unique situation geologically speaking. And that's why ultimately the end end result is the bigger crystals, cleaner, sharper crystallization and really beautiful luster. Prior to your mining operation in Madagascar, how was the presence of demantoid garnet uh, detected or identified? How did they find it there? I think very similar to how most gems were discovered, which is by luck, by chance. It's the deposits <laughs> located in northern Madagascar. And as I'm sure you're quite familiar, if you go around the world, a lot of the, the best gems discoveries were either by a farmer or a fisherman or some type of nomad that's you know traveling over a land and stumbles across some colored object that kicks off really good good uh, color and appearance in, in sunlight. And that very much was a story of Madagascar. That initial discovery sparked a mining rush that lasted about six months. And as is also frequently the case, when there's a mining rush, it tends to be a little bit disorganized. And the workers typically will work about 15, 20, as much as 30 feet down into the earth, which is when they hit the water table. And at that point, because they're working very artisanally with not much more than pickaxes or little buckets, it's impossible to continue the work. And that very much was the case of, of the Madagascar discovery. My partner, who's the famous uh, geologist, Dr. Federico Pezzotta of Pezzotite fame, for those of you that are tracking rare gems back home, Dr. Pezzotta spent about two to three years studying the geology of the deposit and uh, worked with a local partner in Madagascar to stake the claim. And essentially, after that initial first six months of mining rush, all the mining activity you know, dissipated and went to you know, the next sapphire or ruby or aquamarine, aquamarine discovery in Madagascar. And the deposit kind of sat dormant until you know, we came along and started picking back up on the mining. Oh, wow. Really great story of finding something initially, but then figuring out a 
kind of sustainable way to get more out of the deposit and not just kind of leave it, leave the surface, you know, remnants mined out and, you know, not leaving so much, uh, you know, opportunity underground. Incredible. I'd love to know more about the early days of your mining operation. I understand you now have a crew of, did you say 75 people? We have about 50 all Malagasy workers working at the mine, a combination of, of you know, male and female. The dis- job description of the workers relate not only from hand miners, but to security folks, to cooks, to mechanics. And then there's obviously the family dependents of these mine workers. Um, are, we're extremely proud of our mining operations and the We'll get into a little bit the genesis of the name of our company, Prosperity Earth, and how we arrived at that. But it's really a kind of an exciting and kind of sustainable and ethical, we could talk more about what that actually means, operation that we're really proud of. And uh, for any of your listeners that do ultimately get to Madagascar, and I know I've already extended the invite to you, Jordan, you're, you guys are always welcome to come and visit and see what we do. Oh, we'd love to. We would love to. Is this an operation that started small and grew or has it been like kind of the same core of people from the beginning? Because I know that your company is all about people and really helping the lives of the individuals who are affected by this mine and their local economy. Prosperity Earth took over this uh, mining operation back in 2017. And it was a really interesting situation because when we first arrived, even though the project was fully permitted, Uh, both with the Ministry of Mines and through the Ministry of the Environment. There was a full environmental action uh, plan that had already been been approved. The level of activity was non-existent. So the first thing we did was made several trips to the area, did a lot of consultation in the local community, and then offered jobs to whoever wanted to be a part of it. So your question about whether or not the project, you know, started small and then grew, in fact, we pretty much started at, I would say, about 35 to 40 people right out of the gates for two reasons. One is that there were a lot of very interested job seekers. And number two, our kind of motivation going in was always to do things in the right way. And that means not, you know, cutting corners wherever possible, but, you know, hiring uh, people to cover all bases. And Even though I would say that we're still small scale, but lightly mechanized mining, there's still a critical mass that you need to have of team and capabilities in order to run smoothly and efficiently. And that's what we're always after is that efficiency, but never losing sight of the fact that given the size of our business and given how, you know, tied into the community we are, that it really always has that family feel as well. I love that. And you've mentioned being tied into the community a couple of times now. I'd love to really dive in and talk about the ethics of your company and how your mining improves the community where where the digging is actually happening. So let's talk about ethics first. And COVID was a very unfortunate situation and altered people's lives like we've never seen. What was interesting in our experience going through COVID was that right in the lead up to COVID, we had always taken a very values orientated approach to doing business. And that meant defining what core values our company cared about, which were being ethical, not cheating, not stealing, being a leader, taking initiative, being a good communicator, operating to high standards of excellence. So all of these core values were something that in a place like Madagascar, wasn't typically how business was conducted. I know in corporate America and some of the other developed countries around the world, a lot of times you look at their website and they they have their you know their vision and values clearly defined on the website, and they have their business strategy clearly defined. And even I'm sure a lot of your listeners, retailers, and family businesses out there have that that same approach to business. This concept that we're talking about is very new and not typically defined or discussed. And it was probably something that I was exposed to in my 10 years working on Wall Street that I tried to bring to Madagascar and share with our team and discuss very openly and figure out how that could be a core way of doing business, which always isn't the case in in Madagascar. And why I'm bringing this up and why it matters is that this 
incredible dislocation that COVID created actually turned out to be a really good test for us to see whether or not we were walking the walk, talking the talk when it came to, to values and this family style approach to doing business. And I would say it was the single biggest factor of not putting the, you know, the apple cart before the horse and saying, okay, we want to, you know, find the largest demand toy crystal in the world, or we want to make the most beautiful ring, but actually starting with a values approach to doing business. And once we did that, and we made that commitment, the ability to actually find beautiful gemstones, the ability to add value and then create jewelry that's world-class, that speaks for itself and is incredibly beautiful, that all flowed from there. Wonderful. And then how would you say that impacts the the individuals who are working in the mine and their everyday lives? Yep. So we, in terms of impact, we generally look at impact as, as a twofold measure. One is environmentally speaking and the other is socially speaking. We've never, as a miner and a gem cutter, taken the approach that we're going to dictate what type of impact we want to have on the local community our approach has always been holistic and consultative. What that means is we go in, we have discussions with all the major players within the community, and those range from the village elders to the official authorities, which could be the mayor, the chief of the district, the chief of the village, which is called the Fuktan, the office coordinator of the gendarme, the chief of the region, civil society, the women's association, the list goes on and on, the FRAM, which is the parent teacher association. And we have a discussion with all of those participants, the doctors at the local clinics, and we say, what's relevant to, to you, you all? And the reality is, is that because we're spending a huge amount of money in mining and paying salaries, the budget is not unlimited. What we do is we try to be involved across all of those areas. And that's that holistic approach that I've, I'm talking about. So when it comes to the environment, Today, for example, I can tell you literally today, we replanted 5,000 uh, mangrove seedlings. And if you look at our Instagram page, we posted some nice pictures and videos of what that looks like. Why mangroves? Mangroves um, have four to, four to five times the uh, carbon sequestration that forest replantation does. So it's a no brainer. And your question about social impact, the social impact tends to be um, first and foremost, relating to women and children, because those are causes that I think any community cares deeply about. In Malagasy society, the woman tends to be the core and the driver of the family. So we're very much focused on supporting a women's association and tying that into things like the mangrove replanting or different education initiatives, giving out school kits or renovating school infrastructure or healthcare initiatives, making sure that people are um, getting the proper medical care that they need, making sure that doctors are paid. There's a whole long list, even things like local infrastructure, you know, contributing money to the security for good law and order. So it's a long list of, of projects, but the projects, again, are driven not by us, but by what the community cares about. A budget is put together and then a description of who's accountable for, for delivering what is defined. And that's how we work. You have quite a bit of involvement in the community. I mean, not just with the mine, but the, the environmental impact. And then it sounds like you're really on the ground floor of working with the individuals in the community. I can imagine that while that's good and wonderful and, and fantastically impactful on their community, I'm sure it is not easy. Have you faced challenges in Madagascar trying to to kind of reach that position where you can influence their community? There's always challenges. And that's a, that's a great question. At the end of the day, the easiest thing to do would be to parachute in and drop aid a certain budget to fixing a road or rehabilitating a school. And there's nothing wrong with that. But because we're the minor and we're there on the ground 24-7, 365 days out of the year, it's requisite that we're always present and there's always this constant engagement. And it's not easy. Challenges that we face tend to be logistical challenges relating to a developed country. Madagascar has had 
some really impactful uh, cyclones this year or hurricanes in this part of the Northern Hemisphere, as we call them, that have been devastating. Fortunately, not in our immediate area, but all along the East Coast. So invariably, there's you know, weather-related issues or there's road and infrastructure issues. If you ever look at the, the highway, the national highway, which would be the equivalent of our you know, interstate highways, they're frequently during the rainy season washed out and impassable such that if you're driving from what we would call state to state, you might spend two days sitting there not being able to transit. And then, of course, I would say one of the constant challenges is always leadership, right, is just making sure that you have the right people in the right position that are doing the right things, taking the right initiative. And that's not always the case in African governments, sad to say. But we ethics and uh, you know good ethos, no no passports. So our prosperity earth business ethics and ethos and values that we cherish uh, transfer from the U.S. all the way to Madagascar and back to the U.S. So we're extremely proud about that. But you're you're right. On my worst day, sometimes we always question. You know, is the hard work ever going to let up? And it doesn't seem to. But What's rewarding is knowing that we're having really positive impact on the ground. Absolutely. And I wanted to bring up too, because it's not just mining that you're involved with, but as a vertically integrated company, you're also cutting the material. And my guess is that those cutters are in Madagascar as well. That's exactly right. So after we mine the gems up in northern Madagascar, we transport them to the capital city, which is now about 15 hours away. So it's no short uh, you know, transit, when we get the product in the capital city of Antananarivo, which is a very beautiful, picturesque city, we bring the product to our, our gem cutting lapidary, which is staffed with about 10 professionals. And they're able to do really top quality, value-added gem cutting. What does top quality mean? It means cutting uh, material with the, the proper proportions, the proper angles, and demantoids, that the type of gemstone, even though it does have more fire than diamond, it has to be cut to the same standards as diamond. So we're, again, super proud of the fact that we're doing that in Madagascar, not in Antwerp or Israel or other countries where maybe the technology is more advanced and they have multi-generations of experience doing such in the diamond trade. We're actually able to achieve those those global standards in Antananarivo and create more jobs and add more value to the to the local economy. I have to say this what you're talking about right now is my favorite thing about the colored gemstone industry and being able to create these incredible opportunities for citizens of a third world country and give them an independence and a financial situation that otherwise they might not have. I think it's a wonderful way to impact people and I wish more consumers understood the positivity behind colored gemstone mining, especially examples like the operation that you have in Madagascar. Absolutely. And if I can just jump in real quickly, before we were mining colored gems, we were actually working with cocoa farmers in northern Madagascar doing chocolate and vanilla. And the ethos is exactly the same where we're all about helping the miner, helping the, the farmer to get the best possible crop or gemstone out of the ground from earth, add value to that so that everyone benefits. And it's this virtuous cycle. And at the end of the day, the customer benefits because yes, we're, we're in the jewelry business, we're in the colored gem business, but I like to tell people I'm in the business of selling value and values. And what I mean by that is that you mentioned you love the value added piece of gem cutting. What that means, it's direct transferability of value to the end customer because we're cutting out a lot of the middlemen and the people that are actually doing a lot of the hard work, be it the miners or be it the gem cutters, are the ones that are able to reap more of the benefits. And that's why the end customer and the retailers and the jewelers should really care about working as close, if not directly with the mining companies, because they're the ones doing a lot of the hard work. The second thing about the values is that the more transparent a supply chain is, and the more you know who's involved, and the more open they are to share what they do and not hide the secret sauce, you're then able to feel a part of 
the values, the vibe, the ethos. What are they bringing to the table? Who are these people that are behind it? And that's why I get back to a comment that I made earlier in the podcast that there's an absolute standing invite for anyone that wants to make the long journey to Madagascar to come visit us at the mine. And we'd love to host you. Go do it. If you're listening, call John, go to Madagascar. (laughs) I'll go with you. Let's all go. (laughs) My husband and I would really love to go out there. (laughs) It's really a amazing experience. And in Madagascar, speaking of of such, because we haven't talked too much about the country is for, for those that don't know, it's an Indian island nation. It's part of Africa, the African continent, but it's an island in the Indian Ocean. That's the fourth largest island in the world. Close to 70% of the flora and fauna are endemic. What that means is anything you see in the wild in nature in Madagascar is only found in Madagascar. So it's pretty incredible when you think of that about the biodiversity and the implications that kind of has on you know today's day and age in the world we live in. If you want to go see some strange things and landscapes and cultures and you know insects and birds and species that you've never seen before, go to Madagascar. And the best part about that, Jordan, is that different than continental Africa, where they have the big five, there's very little animals that will kill you in Madagascar. (laughs) So you can sleep well at night. Well, there's a sales pitch for you. There are very few animals that will kill you. (laughs) It is the least Australian of the African countries. Excellent. Well, yes, I definitely encourage listeners to explore this and also to get on Prosperity Earth's website. There are photos on there. And if you're watching the video podcast, which is available on the Jewels of the Trade YouTube channel, we're also showing photographs there of the mines and just, I mean, just the beauty of Madagascar. So please take the time to research that and learn more about the Malagasy people, the Madagascar mines and landscape. I mean, it's what makes selling gemstones richer for us, the salespeople, for the individuals, for the jewelry professionals who are working directly with the customer, understanding where the stone comes from and being able to relay the positivity of that gem's impact to your customer is very rewarding. And it it gives you so much more expertise in the field and, and just more, I think, confidence in what we're doing as an industry. I love being reminded of the international impact that gemstones really have. So John, I don't think we had a chance. I've been wanting to ask you, why is it called prosperity earth? Prosperity for us relates to this virtuous cycle that we're trying to create where there's tremendous give back. At the end of the day, we're a for-profit company that's trying to make money and deliver an exceptional product to the end consumer. But there's an extreme ethos attached to that where at the same time as we're, we're making money, we want to bring all the people along with us that touch our business. And that's that give back to the community, be it social impact or environmental give back to leave the world a better place for the areas that we work in. So prosperity for me is that all-encompassing best term that we could think of over probably a eight-month, 10-month period of brainstorming and trying to come up with the best, best term. That was the one word that really encapsulates what we're trying to do. How long do you think Prosperity Earth will be able to mine Demantoid Garnet in Madagascar? And by that, I guess I'm asking, what is the future for Prosperity Earth and Madagascar Demantoid? The future of Prosperity Earth in Madagascar is very bright in the sense that Madagascar is a bit of an El Dorado when it comes to color gems, that there needs to be more Prosperity Earths in Madagascar attaching strong ethos and values to the business of colored gem trade. And we're very open in saying that, that we would love to have friendly competition there because it's going to create more structure and more scalability in the colored gem market in Madagascar. As far as how long we might be mining Demantoid, it's at a minimum several years, but realistically, maybe another seven, eight, as much as 10 years. You also have to you know, consider that you're talking to a miner and a miner always looks at the world with a rosy color glasses. So it, it may be 20 years for all I know. <laughs> a lot of it stems from how efficient we are at what we do, but definitely the deposits, um, a very unique geological setting, and there's plenty of demand to it to be mined. But 
at the same time, there's, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, tremendous challenges associated with being a minor and not all of which are man-made, some of which are, are mother nature. So we'll see. We're very optimistic. For those of you who are working in retail jewelry and listening to this podcast, be sure to stick around for part two and learn more about the demand for Demantoid Garnet and how to satisfy it by delivering accurate information in selling and about how to speak confidently to your customer about Demantoid Garnet, especially from Madagascar. John, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope everyone sticks around to check out part two of this interview to learn about Demantoid's uniqueness rarity and gemology and be sure to subscribe to our youtube channel subscribe to our podcast and visit the blog to get links on all of the incredible information that we discussed today john real quick before we go how can retailers reach you what is the best way for them to get in contact with you the best way to reach us jordan would be contacting us through our website or instagram prosperity earth us Um, we're a wholesaler of loose gems and a little bit jewelry those would be the two best ways to reach us. Excellent. Thanks so much, John. Everyone look forward to part two. Thanks, Jordan.